I am very happy to be with Tabor West, founder of Gravity Works and TEK Advisory Group. Uh, he's located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Welcome to the show, Tabor. Good to be here. Um, I I discovered Tabor uh, when I was I was looking for somebody to sell. Uh, Nakamura Turning Center too. Uh, I had him in on a list as somebody that potentially might have one. Um, couldn't make any machinery deal, but he was uh, quite interested in doing a podcast with me and um, learned about his company, Gravity Works, that's spelled with an X at the end, and um, they make e-bikes. So I wanted to learn about e-bikes. I, I just happened to be in Rome with my wife and we rented some e-bikes and it, it was just awesome. So, um, yeah, give me, give me the scoop on Gravity Works and uh, Tech Advisory Group. And I'm sure you've got an interesting story how you got into both of those. So I, I would love, <laughs> I would love yeah. to, uh, to find out. I'll give you a little history. So um, I started out as a oh, junior electrical engineer in the Navy um, way back when, 1989, <laughs> first Gulf War, and um, started, uh, started my degree while I was in and finished it at New Mexico State University um, afterward, uh, then went to work for a series of small companies like Unisys and Intel. And uh, <laughs> then um, got pulled into Los Alamos National Laboratory. I actually, you know, full disclosure, grew up in Los Alamos and in the mountains above Los Alamos. And um, that's where they do the nuclear testing. Well, not the testing, uh, the building, <laughs> the research. Okay. Yeah. So I worked on a, a number of interesting projects there, two supercomputers, um, ran some of the very first fiber networks in existence. Um, built their enterprise application suites, cybersecurity, uh, many, many projects for DOE and DOD and, and NSA that, oh, I'm sure they'll declassify them someday when we're dead. <laughs> but it gave me a, a pretty varied background in a lot of really interesting things from advanced manufacturing to digital systems, programming. Um, I actually have three engineering degrees and so I do electrical wow. engineering, complex systems, and software engineering. Um, one of my primary fields is designing and building uh, level three data centers. Um, I assisted Microsoft with the first uh, data centers um, for Azure more than 20 years ago. That's why um, you were so patient when we were trying to set up the podcast. I've been through it. Oh, <laughs> you under you understand. I was getting so nervous and like. Uh, oh no no no! Believe me, I, I I know the transports. I know where it's going. I um, so I deal with it daily. And what's interesting is um, I have always had this epiphany for designing bicycles. So even though I do very large scale work, like uh, one of my most recent projects, um was I was the CTO of solutioning at DXE Technology, which is the merger of Computer Sciences Corp and Hewlett Packard Services, um, small $25 billion company. Wow. And, <laughs> yeah. and so most of my clients were the Fortune 100 and even Fortune 50. Um, so Toyota, Nissan, General Dynamics, um, Kroger, you know, MasterCard, you name it, right? And what uh, what I got into there was um, designing out an autonomous driving program for BMW, Fiat Chrysler, and Daimler, right? Because everybody has to have an autonomous car. Um, the car that I've actually ordered is a Tesla. <laughs> yeah. As we were discussing earlier, they notified me and said, by the way, we're sending that to you on a truck. And, wow. Okay. I wasn't expecting that till the end of the year, but all right. What kind um, did you buy? Uh, bought a Model Y Performance. That's the so, SUV. Uh, yeah, it's the it's the CUV um, that they've come out with. It's based on the Model Three, and um, I I tend to know it inside and out already, but there's going to be more to discover. So, 
just looking at it from an engineering standpoint, I'll probably eventually turn it into a robot. Um, you know, something to play with, right? <laughs> but um, along those lines, I actually did my first bicycle composite frame designs uh, in high school, or thereabouts 1987 to 1988. Um, actually swapped some time with a machine shop in Los Alamos that did primarily uh, contract machining for the National Laboratory. And um, that's where I learned how to do machine operations and, and such. Yeah, things weren't really CNC back then. Um, I learned AutoCAD on AutoCAD version one on an IBM 8088. <laughs> wow. So I've been through the first versions of Katia and SolidWorks and Solid Edge and Inventor and all of that. You know, um, right now I use uh, SolidWorks and I use um, I use AutoCAD um, uh, Fusion 360, okay. um, just as as readily available tools. Um, but that that kind of drive to do the bicycle thing has always been kind of just floating there on the edge of things while I do large scale server design and data centers and application structuring and things like that uh, because it's fun. And um, when I was younger, I raced bicycles professionally, both triathlon uh, road and then mountain bikes. Wow. And wow. Um, and that's um, both painful and financially ungainful. So very satisfying. <laughs> Which one but, did you like better? Um, to tell you the truth, mountain bikes, right? Um, mountain bikes didn't really exist when I started racing road and triathlon. Yeah. And so back then, what we had available to us was basically a strengthened steel frame, tangay steel, you know, braze welded joints. None of this was TIG welded at the time. And um, no suspension. So you'd come off a jump and the bike could go wherever it decided it wanted to. <laughs> you were really along for the ride. And uh, so then that kind of progressed. I've, I've tested just about every component there is in existence out there over the last 30 years that's come along. And uh, I saw where things were beneficial and where there were deficits. So, oh, let's see, about six years ago, I restarted Gravity Works, and the primary focus there was building state-of-the-art carbon fiber mountain bike wheels, all right? Okay. So we had wheels out there in carbon, very expensive, you know, upwards of $3,200 to $3,600 a set um, from Look and Envy and some of those guys. Um, and I said, well, we can definitely make this one better feature-specific. Right, so water profiles for better tire profile, lighter, tubeless, um, without requiring tape, some innovations like that. And this, um, this is, better... sorry to interrupt, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is before the e-bike, this is just mountain bike. Correct, this is before the e-bike, okay. right. And so um, I designed up multiple wheel molds, started producing you know, composite wheels um, and testing them probably farther than others test their gear. <laughs> I've got, you know, so having raced in bicycles and been in the industry for so long, I know a lot of people that are still in competition and, and such. So that gives me a ready pool of, of testers. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, um, I'm not small, um, six foot tall, weigh 300 pounds. I could wow. probably stand to lose about 80 of those at the moment. But um, part of the reason that my bicycle career wasn't probably the top of the stack is because um, my bare weight would be in at about 200 pounds if, if you stripped everything off of me, right? So if I'm trying to compete against a climber who's 135 pounds and I'm 200 pounds, well, physics is physics. But when so, you were when you were competing, were you also um, on the bigger side or were you more in shape or kind of in the middle? In when between? I was 5% body fat, I was 189 pounds. So there's just no getting smaller than that for me. <laughs> so you're a big, Basically, you're just a, I'm a big boned. Yeah, exactly. Right. I was just, I'm just big, you know, it's just the way it is. My, my calves hit the uh, seat tube when I pedal. So <laughs> the, you know, arm, armor doesn't fit me. That's <laughs> you know, all, all kinds of funny stories about that over the years. Um, but me being trapped in my, you know, leg armor and stuff like that and people having to cut it off of me and, you know, right. fun, fun things like that. Um, but 
what I discovered is that there was this lack of bicycle technology for either riders my size or riders who really hit the trails hard. The kind of stuff that you watch in the Red Bull Rampage and on pretty much, well, any Red Bull video that gets published out these days, um, you know, or any of the any of the fun movies showing up on YouTube and whatnot. And so I was seeing even young riders just breaking things left and right, snapping frames in half, forks, wheels, mm. you know, they, they crush them like tinfoil. And so I thought, well, we can do better. <laughs> we have the technology, right? We can build it faster, stronger, better. And so I looked at what was out there and I said, you know what? I need to produce a higher level of component. We've got the basics in place, but we don't necessarily have the technologies applied to the bicycle industry. They're used in aerospace. Um, they're used in ballistics, things like that. But they're not used in aerospace. And I mean, I'll give you an example. So let's see, where's a, there we go. Here's a, so can you see that right there? What? It, That's a cut uh, section of one of my rims. Okay, describe this to people that are just listening. Right. So what this is, is this is a hollow composite layup in a mold, three piece. And what it is, is that is Torre T700 carbon fiber in a pre-impregnated form that's been laid up in the mold and then compressed um, as well as a vacuum applied and baked in an oven, okay? Interesting. And so what that does is that produces, this is a piece, this is one of my test um, sections right here. And what you see there, well, you can see in the kind of profile I'll show you, this rim bed has no holes in it for the spokes, right? Ah, uh, so and, I've that's, developed that, techniques. and that's, that's, totally, that's totally unconventional. Exactly. Here's another piece right here, and you see the holes clearly, right? The mm -hmm. holes for the spokes to go through. And so this is the old way, the one you just showed me. Right, right. So what I did is I developed techniques to build a conventional wheel so that the parts are replaceable readily in a bike shop when you happen to be somewhere, I don't know, Mongolia, right? <laughs> you know, you're out on your favorite bike packing trip for three weeks. So um, what I did is I came up with techniques to utilize those components. Then I sought out some suppliers who made ultra strong components. But what I then found is that in the United States and even most of Europe, there was a lack of suppliers. You have to go to Asia. You just don't have a choice. Right. And so there's all the logistical problems that we had before COVID-19. Now those <laughs> are compounded, you know, tenfold with COVID-19. There's no planes, there's no containers, there's no ships. Nothing is taking off from China, Taiwan, Malaysia um, right now. So I have the factories, I have the engineers over there that I work with and whatnot, but they had the ready facilities, which is why you and I were introduced, right? So I started looking for machine tools that could do what I needed to do. I created the process. Now I needed to find a tool that could do it correctly. So I've got plenty of machine shops with state-of-the-art mills, um, DMG and Samsung here in Los Alamos, because yeah. they're all contractors to the laboratory. So they're cutting. So for instance, a friend of mine who is a master's um a downhill mountain bike champion in the United States. He owns an automotive technology company, lives up here in Los Alamos down the street from me. And he's one of my testers. His father-in-law machines the precise waveguides for the CERN particle accelerator. Wow. They're trying to take infusion, right? Yeah. So we're talking about some really precise machining work here. What we're not talking about is precise uh, shall we say production grade. So cutting a hub shell, for instance, like I'll show you here. So this is, this is one of my hubs, right? Wow. That's this beautiful. is 148 millimeter state of the art bicycle hub right here. And there's a number of components in here, right? So this is made up. So that right. right. Yeah, I've made oh. that tool free, right? Hold on, you, you just cut out for a second. Say that again. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so this is the axle cap. This is the part that would interface with the frame. You can see the axle and you can see the cartridge bearing inside. You can see that it's 
blind and threaded to accept the disk for the disk break, all right? All right, and then on this side, this is what accepts the cassette that your chain rides on, multi-gear, in this case, 11 or 12 speed. And then you've got the body. So this body right here that you see, that would yeah. be forged from a 70, 75 ingot of aluminum alloy. Then heat wow. treat, then machine down, and then every little detail, like um, you see the spoke holes there? Yeah. Okay, they have to be 3D milled. They're at, they're at completely different angles in space relative to the axle and the hub body because they have to precisely interface with the holes in the rim uh, roughly 16 inches away from the hub. And then they have to be brought up to 120 kgf of force with each spoke. And so it's a really precise body. Like I'll show you what, what that free hub body looks like. So here's the Shimano compatible version, and you can see the poles, right? And the springs and the retainers. On this side, you can see the bearings. So there's multiple pieces just in making this one piece, which has to fit onto that other piece. And so that makes a whole hub. And, and every single piece of that, I need to engineer, control, manufacture, and assemble at tolerance, and then make sure it stays functional for years in a high torque application. And you engineered all of it yourself. Right, yeah, this is one. This is 100% my design right here. However, this free hub is licensed from SRAM. Okay. And this free hub here is licensed from Shimano, but I still had to engineer the component. All they specify are these particular little risers and veins on here, right? Mm -hmm. And that's so that it fits their cassette design. Other than that, they don't care how it interfaces to the hub. So it's up to me to define that component there. And is this totally different from any any other e-bike you're going to find? Because well, this, yeah. is, so, this is just uh, so Shane, much more see. rugged. And So here's a, here's a competitor hub from Switzerland. That's uh -huh. a DT Swiss hub right there. Very similar to my hub, but actually heavier, but a completely different mechanism inside. So as an example, right? Now, here's the problem. It's made in an Switzerland? E yep. What's that? It's made in Switzerland? Uh, actually, no. That one's made in China. Ah. <laughs> DT yeah, say, Swiss. If, but... if it was made in Switzerland, I'm sure it would be good and expensive. Right. The ones that are made in Switzerland, so that hub right there, the retail on it would be about $400. The one made in Switzerland, the retail would be about $900. Ah, sounds like machine tools. Mm, exactly. And that's that's exactly what we discovered, was the costs are astronomical. So to make up the difference and make a component, you've got to have a machine that can roll those out at speed. So when I take an ingot over with a CAD file to one of my local machine shops and they put it on a state-of-the-art five-axis mill, we're talking an hour and 10 minutes to make that hub. And there's four different operations and usually two mills involved to get it done. So what I started looking for were state-of-the-art mills that could do that all inside of a single operation. Okay. Which actually becomes a very select list because they weren't really built for this application. They were built for other applications, usually aircraft grade. Um, so which so ones are you have, using? What machines? So we've right now we profiled it on um, on Samsung. Samsung. Yep, because they've got they've got multi-access Swiss type um, advanced mills that are designed for feeding in bar stock. Yeah. Right. So I can have the producer make me a huge rod of 7075 that's been cold drawn and heat treated, which makes an extremely strong billet, but I have to have it turned and parted and CNC'd all inside the same machine and then have a robotic picker pull it off. And Samsung is the one that makes the one that seems... Well, Samsung, Samsung is like, makes the one that's more affordable. The other ones are made in I was going to say, they're cheap, right? Right, they're cheap. Whereas in Germany, they are four times the cost. Right, so for an, in, an Index C300 would yeah. absolutely do the job. For a hundred thousand dollars just to get the picker <laughs> right we're talking about a million dollars for the base mill 
And yeah. but the difference is at that one hour and 10 minutes to make a single hub body using conventional means, or when I profile it inside of an index C300, for instance, um, about four and a half minutes to make wow. that same hub shell. Yeah. So if you have the right part, you know, how, right. how so long the right does it take on the Samsung? Makes all the difference. Exactly. And on the Samsung? And the Samsung, it profiles out to about nine and a half minutes. So about twice the time. And how is the how would be the precision compared to the index? Good Interestingly, enough. the Samsung has about the same precision. What's different is the index has built-in cooling towers. Uh -huh. So it can run 24 hours on duty cycle. The uh -huh. Samsung's, we'd probably have to cut that to half or slightly less than half that time. Right. right. But you don't have enough. You, you have a small enough volume that you probably don't need. Well, so the funny thing about that volume is um, that hub I showed you from DT Swiss, um, they're producing about 50,000 of those hubs a month. So the bicycle industry is far larger than most people realize. Um, that right now is a $17 billion a year industry. Now, when we get back to the e-bikes, to your question earlier, this is what's interesting. An e-bike, whereas one of my ultralight road bikes would be fully built with an entire group set ready to ride at about 16 pounds with disc brakes, hydraulic. Let, let me interrupt you a second. I just want to understand. Yeah. So, so these components, you're you're a contractor with those. This is the e-bike is your own bike, but the what you're using the Samsung for, that's to supply other bike makers. Well, both myself and others, okay. right? So, so effectively, I can build OEM wheel sets and hub sets for other manufacturers, as well as my own Gravity Works components. Okay. Right? Now, the demand these days tends to be for boutique hand-built wheels. So I do all of that here. Um, however, the, the tricky part is actually the hubs, not so much the composite layup. The composite layup isn't as hard to do. Machining a precise hub to those tolerances and those weights, that's that's what comes, um, comes down to what type of device you use, what type of anodizing process and heat treating process, what post assembly methods are used, and that level of precision mm -hmm. that's needed for that even down to bearing selection, seal selection, material type. And so what I've been trying to do is increment the innovation, you, right? You can't make giant leaps because nobody's ready for it. Every other bicycle out there won't accommodate it. So you have to make small changes. Now, because I build my own bicycles, I can also make those specific changes and incremental jumps myself um, but it has to be as a complete bike, right? Mm. Because when I change one component, it changes nine other components in there. Interesting. Um, now, I'll give you another interesting little example of something I do that no other bicycle manufacturer on earth does. So this right here is a prototype rear derailleur, okay? Now, that is CNC milled and painted. A prototype what? So this is a rear derailleur. So this is the shifting mechanism oh, wow. for the chain on the rear of the bicycle. And I designed this specifically for heavy-duty mountain bike use and for my e-bikes. And the reason being, the e-bike is significantly heavier than a conventional bicycle. And the torque loads of adding, say, 70 newton meters of additional torque to the motor unit um, puts severe stress across the chain, the chain ring, the rear cog, and that free hub mechanism that you saw in the hub earlier. So they all have to be redesigned to accommodate that. Then take a rider that weighs as much as I do <laughs> and think about the span between a 100-pound rider and a 300-pound rider on the same bicycle. Right. right? It's, it's tremendous. So we have to get really, really precise with the way every single component on the bicycle is designed and manufactured. Because with a car, you can say, hey, you know, let's add a little bit of extra reinforcement right here and nobody will notice that welder, that rib or that bracket. You know, okay, the car weighs 
3,800 pounds or it weighs 3,850 pounds. On a bicycle, an extra pound is noticeable, mm. right? So we're down to grams on things. I mean, six or seven grams on a component matter because they add up. And you plan to sell this bike to the same bike to somebody who weighs 100 pounds and 300 pounds. Right, right. So the bike's up. You can see the bike up on the website, and there's a bunch of video of me climbing some really gnarly terrain on it on YouTube on the Gravity Works channel. Um, so we won't we won't go over detail on that just yet. We can do that in a future um, cast, and I can show you the full detail. We we'll have to set it up in the shop. Sure. Um, but the the difference is most e-bikes out there in the full suspension long travel range. So my e-bike has six and a half inches of front and rear suspension travel. Um, 203 millimeter disc brake up front, 180 in the rear, 12 speed um, drivetrain, and it's got a 504 watt hour battery and it uses a Shimano 250 watt motor unit um, and computer. And I can get 55 miles of heavy climbing out of a single battery charge on that bike. Wow. Now, part of the reason I can do that, even at my body weight, is whereas a typical bike in that range would be in the 53 to 55 pound range, mine is 44 and a half pounds. Oh. And that's through extreme machining and forging so technologies. It's, so it's light, but it can hold heavier. It's, it's lighter, but it can hold heavier. Exactly. So that's where you get into the exotics of the design. It's kind of like designing a Formula One race car versus designing, you know, the same Ferrari street car, right? Wow. Um, that Ferrari can withstand forces far beyond what the street car can. Obviously, it costs a lot more, but it's a fraction of the weight, yet can take four times the G-forces in every corner. Wow. Now, like the e-bike that when I was in Rome and uh, mm -hmm. we rented that, yeah, I mean, it seemed relatively nice, but what, uh, how does that compare to yours? I mean, like that, I think had like two or three speeds you could make the electric part go. You say right. yours is 13 speed. That's not 13 speed in electric. Well, 12. Speed. Yeah, 13. There, there's one, there's one company out there that makes it. Yeah. So what it is, is there's a chain ring. Here's a, here's an example. That is a 12 speed forged and machined and heat treated and shot peened and anodized alloy 7075 chain ring, right? Of, of my design and my build. So that's up front. So you can change the size of this 30, 32, 34, 36, 38 teeth, right? For what let's call it the ratio. Then on the rear, the cassette is 12 speeds and it's 10 tooth at the bottom and it's 50 tooth at the top. So you get a 500% overall ratio change there. Now, I actually have prototypes I've designed that are nine tooth on the smallest cog and 50 tooth on the largest cog mm -hmm. um, for an even greater ratio change. Um, the idea being that it's far simplified from older mountain bikes, which had three chain rings up front, a front shifter, front derailleur, rear derailleur. And back then they were generally nine up to 11 speed in the rear. So, that advancement's significant because it lightens the bike, it reduces the moving components that could wear, and it introduces more reliability, um, a little more longevity, and less components to replace when they wear out, mm -hmm. right? So that, that's an example where it's gotten better, where we've gone backwards in technology. So we went up from single speed, up to multi-speed, up to two chain rings in the front, your good old 10 speed from when we were kids, right? Mm -hmm. up to three chain rings in the front, back down to two, back down to one, and then removing the front derailleur and shifter altogether. Now, with an e-bike, what you experienced is you had three-speed, and the motor would help you overcome hills and things because it could add in the extra torque. Yeah. Now, with an e-mountain bike, what I'm trying to do is make that dynamic so that you're still using your whole gear set, but the difference is instead of climbing a small hill, you could climb a hill at a 20% grade sustained over rock. And once again, up there on YouTube, I've put videos up. You can see it in action. It's real. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so, so now people can ride things that they just flat out couldn't ride. Like last November, I was testing in Moab with friends. And there's a little burrito joint downtown on, on kind of the uh, south side, 
great breakfast burritos. And we were in there and an older gentleman, I mean, white hair, you know, well into his seventies, no doubt. Um, he was in there and he had two e-bikes on the back of his Subaru and he was reading his iPad and eating his eggs. And I said, Hey, you know, how do you like the e-bikes? And he said, he said, they're life-saving. He said two things. One, he said, I can now ride with my granddaughter on a bike on the trail. Mm -hmm. And he said, two, my wife rides with me now. And he said, they make sure that we get on a bike every single day and ride. He said, otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. He said, my knees hurt, my hips hurt. My, you know, he said, I've had knee replacement, all of that already, right? So to get people back on, and interestingly, I'm in that case. Because of my other business, which requires me to sit on an airplane for 18 hours at a time flying around the world or in a chair in meetings, we get fat. That, that's just the consequence of modern yeah. IT work is this is what happens. It doesn't matter if you go for a ride or a run. You just you have to be diligent. And what I found is that my bicycle capacity had just dropped radically. And I said, OK, I need to go try an e-bike. So I went and tried an e-bike, you know, from a competitor, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I said, hmm, this is amazing. This is eye opening, but it can be better. Sure. <laughs> right? Sure. And so that's when I designed the mold and, and created my first sets and and tried it out. Now, the difference was I wasn't starting at ground zero. I had all the bicycle design knowledge of all the bikes I've built before and all the ones I've ridden and tested. So the good news is when my bikes came out of the mold, um, my very first prototypes that I've built up that you've seen on the videos, I'm now past 500 miles of riding and 63,000 feet of climbing on the initial prototypes with zero failure. Wow. So that's so, the beauty of modern design. Very impressive. You, so, all right, I just want to make sure I understand the time frame. Yep. So you were making bikes until like six years ago, and then you took a six-year hiatus, and then you started well, making actually, the e-bikes again? A, so I took more than a six-year hiatus. So I started building bikes um, in the late eighties, then I was in the Navy in college. Um, then I started again, but just custom work and all um, mountain so bikes or different kinds. Um, these were mountain bikes and this was, this was back in, um, oh, in the mid nineties and, you know, into the late nineties, two thousands. Um, but I was also racing for other teams like Trek and GT bicycles. And I was doing a lot of component testing and advisory work around that so everything from crank sets to hubs to spokes and forks and all of that stuff for other companies because frankly if you think you're going to get rich designing bicycles <laughs> good luck <laughs> right? yeah so engineering work is far more lucrative than building bicycle work you got to love doing it yeah um, unless you have massive capital backing you like walmart or something like that you're not going to get there Right. I, I see so many young designers come to me and they're like, oh, can you help us with this? Can you? Yeah, I will show you how that works gladly. And if you can make a business of it, I applaud you. <laughs> so try, try, but have a contingency plan. Um, and this is why I have Tech Advisory huh. Group, obviously. So how many, how much of your components are made in Asia? Um, at this point right now, most are yeah. made in Asia. We just, we no longer have the production capacity in the United States. It's, yeah. it's been so farmed out at this point that you can't even go to a sub to get that necessary, you know, component. And we're talking about the base level stuff, the forging of the base metals, getting the carbon initial layup, things like that. They do it so well over there and we do it so poorly over here. Um, even though we build most of the technology here, we just immediately ship it over there for production. And unfortunately, this is a consequence of the continued condensation of so many companies into mega companies, because once they get that big, the only thing that really matters when you're a publicly traded company is Bottom quarterly line. earnings and shareholder reports. That's it. All right. So most of what you see innovative um component wise in the US, Germany, um, places like that, South Africa, Australia coming out these days are little boutique shops. And unfortunately they come and go at a rate because they just can't 
sustain it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we interviewed, um, a guy who assembles road bikes in the United States. He, it's called Detroit bikes. Yeah. He went, you, are you familiar? Oh yeah. Very. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it sounded like it was sort of an anomaly, even just to be assembling. Well, here's why they're just assembling right yeah so they're not um, for instance i mean they're making the spokes here or something and well yeah but that but not not the actual parts yeah right right and that's what you find is is for instance um when i'm doing a bike right now i would prefer to be doing everything here in my shop and the reason being is not for expediency it's for absolute quality control when I control my entire supply line, I can make sure that the quality is far, far beyond um, anything that you're seeing coming in from Asia or whatnot. Because when it comes down to it, yeah, there'll be ISO 9000 certified and whatnot. I will get a batch of a thousand of something that are just right. And the next batch will be just wrong. And yeah. somebody didn't heat treat correctly or somebody missed a tolerance on something. and I've had it happen so many times to the point where th- there's no way to guarantee reliability. Even when I have an inside person who's there watching it and yeah. just riding constantly, they still mess it up. And so, you know, there are some companies here that why I help. Is, why, why is that? It's just that the people are just not, the, the ship is not that tight over there. Um, correct. So over there, what happens are people are commodity more than they are here. So if a person has a skill set, there'll be 10 factories that do exactly the same thing. And they can lure that person away for an extra buck an hour at the snap of a fingers. They can just walk out the door and walk right over to the other factory across the street. This happens to me in India with computer work constantly too. A whole team will be trained up and they'll literally walk across the street in Chennai or Hyderabad or, you know, any of those places because frankly, they've got a skill set. The skill set's in demand, right? Yeah. So that kind of leads to the whole automation and RPA processes and things like that. They come into digital manufacturing where part of it is, you want to employ people, but those people need to be invested. They need to actually be part of the company. They need to be owners. They need to be, they need to have a real tie and in investment. Otherwise, they're just shopping. They're they're contract workers. Yeah. And that's great if a person's assembling, building wheels, something like that. Hey, you got a great skill set, we pay you, you know, off you go. But when they're responsible for a component that you literally could die on if it breaks, that's a whole different world, <laughs> right? Yeah. And those components cannot break. And often I see that they do. So for instance, my carbon wheels, you can break one. Of course, you can break anything on earth, right? You know, that, but none of mine have ever catastrophically failed ever. Right. I've seen stuff just come apart in pieces, just boom, you know, that's it. And it's like, whoa, you know, and, and uh, it's like, yeah, okay, that can't ever happen ever, ever, ever. Right. So, you know, we test to that point to make sure it never happens. And then the ultimate test is me getting on it on a rocky trail and pounding down. I mean, there's days where we've done 45 miles of descending on downhill trails at a skiery in a single day, you know, just pounding the components into the ground. And you do it again and again and again and again until it breaks. Right. And so sounds, sounds like you it's enjoy hard that. for a company to do that. Right. <laughs> You like you you like pushing it to the limit, pounding. Well, it. somebody has to, because <laughs> you sure don't want it to be a customer discovering the limits out there somewhere uh, when you didn't, right? And Absolutely. and so you know that's a big component of it. Very interesting. Yeah. How much does one cost? Frame set with motor unit and battery. We'll call that the core oh, of a bike. Oh, hold right? on, hold on. Start over. You cut out for a second. Let's. Start oh, sorry. Over. So, so the base. So a frame set with a motor unit and a battery. So the core components of the bike that don't change, no matter what what group set. Um, that part right there would come in around six thousand mm-hmm. dollars. 
Now, wheels, bars, um, shifters, derailleurs, those can vary. There's different levels of component. So if we're talking about Shimano, they have SLX, XT, XTR group sets. If you want to get really exotic, then SRAM makes a wireless shifter and rear derailleur mechanism. They're about $1,700 just for, <laughs> for the two components on so, there. So when you buy one of these, it's like you're customizing it, like you're, built, like, like right. you're building a computer or something. Right. So what everybody else is doing, if you were to go buy one from Specializer Trek, they make great products, right? I've raced them. I've ridden them for years. Um, but they make them in large batches in a factory with a lot of workers. And therefore, they have to have a component spec, right? They have to know mm -hmm. a year ahead of time what it is. Um, what I can do is because I make the frame, the stems, the handlebars, all of that, the wheels, um, you can choose whatever brakes you want. You can yeah. choose whatever derailleur, shifter, cassette chain you want, as long as I've tested it and validated and they offer a good warranty from the manufacturer on it. So you're, can, but you're aiming at a certain niche. You're aiming at the true right. connoisseur, not just like your Yeah, your these, these are not your average. Right. <laughs> you know, you're you're at, at a minimum you're buying a base level Porsche 911, right? You know that would be the comparison. Now you can so go how up much from is, there. So how much is your Porsche 911? So so for the the most basic bike right now, I'm trying to keep the price within sixty nine hundred dollars, fully okay. built, ready to go, right? Um, now that could go as high as twelve thousand dollars with some really exotic components on it. Wow. Right. And, and there people... could be a two pound weight difference between those two as well. Mm -hmm. And you sell the non e-bikes as well. Yep. I manufacture and sell non e-bikes, but how my much focus... do those, how much do those go for? Around well, the they, those could be a lot less, right? So those could be down from the 3,900, um, to about the $7,000 range. Okay. So there's a pretty big difference when you remove all those electronics, the motor unit, the battery. Are these for competitive people competing in? Oh yeah. Races oh yeah. We, my, my bicycles have been in world enduros and, and big mountain enduro series and, and multiple bike races. Oh yeah. And there's e-bikes in. There's so e -bike just now this, this year is the first year we've seen sanctioned e-bike racing from the UCI, the world governing body of cycling this is the first year. And unfortunately, all the races are canceled right now. <laughs> so everybody was getting ready to go. And, you know, the Sea Otter Classic, all these big events this year, all canceled. Wow. Oh. Yeah, they might occur later in the year. But I, I know a lot about how this virus is progressing and the technology and whatnot. I can tell you that that probability is pretty low. We're all going to be you, confined for a while. What do you know? What, what can you tell us? Well... So one of the things that I do on the other side of the house is big data and analytics um, for corporations and the government and whatnot. We compile a lot of data. We provide a lot of those services. And looking at the running totals and the numbers, we effectively could have locked this virus down if everyone had locked down South Korea style yeah. um, for about three weeks. If you literally just paused the entire economy, everything, just said, everybody's locked in. We're going to go test everyone. If we find that you're infected, we're going to treat you in your home. Or if you need to go to a hospital, we're going to take you to a hospital in a, in a specifically separated ward, right? I mean, I had a good conversation with a physician last night who is infected, who is a friend of mine right now. And he's mm -hmm. trying to figure out ways when, as he recovers, and he is recovering. The physician who infected him is in the ICU right now that's yeah. that's how radical the difference is and so unfortunately in the united states the of the people infected currently the running number is that 26 um, percent are dying of those with identified cases um, who actually have to be treated now the problem is there's this huge portion of the population who has no symptom whatsoever they're asymptomatic right. and we're seeing it on on the aircraft carriers right now where these are young people healthy right fit and um up to 60 percent of the cases are asymptomatic there the problem is the they other four spread they're spreaders and they have it for a long time because their immune system isn't taking it out and so oh. because it's a coronavirus so even, even is, if they don't have symptoms 
they could spread it for a long time? For a long time, because their immune system's not really battling it. So they're kind of the old typhoid Mary um, stereotype, right? They're oh. running around, they're doing all their normal work, blah, 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 blah. And this, this virus is so contagious that it can be spread simply through breathing and talking. You don't have I to thought, sneeze. Or... I thought that it only, even if you were asymptomatic, it would just go through you in mm. two weeks. I've, or... I've got friends that have that have been positive for more than a month with the virus. And they wouldn't know? They Oh, no, they knew. They've gone through the symptoms. They've gone through fever, chain coughing that they thought was going to crack their ribs. And they've come out, and two weeks later, they're still showing the viral load, even though they're back up and hiking around. And people are saying, oh, you're immune. Well, nope, no guarantee of that. <laughs> We're seeing a lot of cases of caregivers who are either reinfected or are not actually shedding the virus. Reinfected? I, yes. I thought that they thought probably. Well, no, because immune. remember, this is not one virus. So this virus has now branched nine times. What? And as of two days ago, 3,717 identified mutations in its phylogeny. So it's it's mutating at 40 times the flu. Dude, why are you telling me this? I was, well, I was because, thinking that we were getting out of the out of the. Yeah, yeah, and that's what people need to understand. The reality of it is, there's a lot of people wishing and hoping, and me, me, right up on the top of them, that we can get things back to to normal and da da da. But the the issue with this, unlike an influenza or one of the others, is that it's a coronavirus, and so far we have never successfully cured a coronavirus, which is what the common cold is, coronavirus. We've had it forever. It's been around right, forever. Isn't it, isn't it just going to go away when, when it gets warm? And no. Nope. Like... In India, India is baking hot right now, and they've got cases everywhere. There's cases in Saudi Arabia. There's cases in Qatar, in Kuwait. These places are raging hot right now. Now, so what's, now, so what's the, a, so, this so is what's why the answer? Fever. What's that? So what's the answer? Um, so the answer to this is going to be to come up with, a, one, an effective treatment protocol. There's a couple of experimental drugs that we're working on. Two, there are some treatment patterns. Uh, one is using common off-the-shelf anti-inflammatories that have already been FDA approved. They're showing promise in treating people who are sick. Um, and then three is going to be coming up with an actual vaccine. The problem is the mutation rate. You, We all know we take the flu vaccine and they're like, oh, damn, we got it wrong. And it was actually B type this year, and everybody gets it right. When they get it right, they get it right. When they get it wrong, they get it wrong. But think about the flu. Every year we get reinfected, sometimes with two or three different strains, right? Well, this is going to be exactly the same thing. It's now endemic in the whole world. We didn't stop it when we should have. And because of that, unlike, say, SARS or MERS or Ebola, we let it spread, and it spread for a long time. The first cases genetically they've identified were early November. So when they started talking about it in January, guess what? It was two and a half months in already ar around the world. In fact, there's a lot of us that wonder. I was I was working on naval destroyers um, around Christmas, and um, I caught something that had really similar symptoms to this, and I was sick for a month. I was coughing for a month. So you think you probably ways. had it? Well, there's a chance um, or one of the variations. The issue is we had no tests, so there's no way for me to validate whether I did or not. Are they are they going to get their tests together? Are they ever going to get that together? Uh, they are. So there's I've got some friends working at places like Fisher Thermo and, and whatnot who are working on. So they already have a rapid test. If you're in Connecticut or you're in Georgia, you can go to a CVS and they could administer a rapid test in the parking lot. And this yeah, they were talking months. about that months ago. Right, right. So that's actually working now. They've got the correct reagent and delivery mechanism. But why? Um, when? When is it going to be around more of the country? Well, that's the problem. It it comes up to one manufacturing and two having enough medical professionals to actually go out and administer it to people. So, and I can give you the number. As as of yesterday, we have only tested one percent of the U.S. population. One percent. That's it. And of that 1%, 26% are infected. So of, of the 3.2 wow. million people we've tested, 640,000 of them have been infected. You're totally so, depressing me. I, 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 
I mean, I must be honest. I really try to stay away from the news. Like, well, even and, and even not during is... even not during this crisis, I really try. I figure my wife she keeps track of the news big time. Other people will tell me if there's something I really need to know. It's such a time suck. Well, it is. It very much is. And and for me particularly, we're working on this actively, right? So I have to know all the data feeds and where things are coming from and da da da. But I have noticed some news stories popping up here and there. And they're shows bullshit. up on my phone or, and it's like, wait a second, those numbers are complete horseshit. Right? They're 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 way off. And are they way off the, in what in what way? Are they overblown? Uh, are they underblown? Both. So what's happened is I've seen them both overblow and underblow almost simultaneously. <laughs> and then re-correct again the next day, right? Because they're just not running the numbers. And and so it's one of those things where to understand something, you have to have data. And you're and working, you personally data. are working with the government? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and of course, the government's as slow as they normally are in getting things done, right? There's no, no magic cure to make contracts work faster or cooperation. I just get things shot at me. You know, I'll get some email from the Air Force and it says, hey, can you provide a bunch of masks? Well, sure, if I had a manufacturing stood up to do it, but I don't. So, you know, but yes, I could theoretically do that. That's why you see the big debacle with the ventilators. Um, the ventilators may not actually help. They may make things worse. What? Yep. So this is one of the this is one of the technical discussions I'm having with physicians right now. The problem with the ventilators are you intubate a person. When you intubate a person, you're controlling the airflow in and out of their lungs. Well, here's the problem. There's no filters on the exhale. So every time you push air into that person's lungs, it the machine exhales viral load into the air. So we need to seal off the whole face. Now in Italy, they came up with a really cool way to do this. Have you seen those um, those snorkeling masks that go over your entire face? You can buy them on Woot and stuff for like 29 bucks. Well, the cool thing about that is it seals the whole face off. So you put the, you put the air source on one end and you put a filter on the exhale side. Now you've actually isolated the viral load. So now you're not infecting 30 people in the ward with the one infected person lying in the bed. But we're not that's doing that at all. Right all right. So, I mean, I would not go to a hospital unless you have to right now. Mm. And that's that's just my personal warning from knowing a whole lot of infected nurses and physicians right now. Is there's too many infected people walking around who don't even know they have the virus. The ones who are going to the hospital know they have the virus. Right. And I've talked to those physicians who have had multiple cases go out that were not identified as the virus that had every characteristic of the virus. Right. They're like, come on, this person had to be. But since we didn't run a test, we can't confirm it. So. Hmm. But we will. We'll overcome it. I'm All right. So. Stop Ebola. <laughs> right. Well, what do you what? What's your timetable then? Number cruncher. Um, so what's going to happen is the load's going to start to drop during the summer, like you indicated. September, October, it's going to shoot back up again because it's going to become the actual seasonal cold. Dude, you're totally bringing me down. So what do we have to do to stop this? Don't touch your eyes and face. Wear a mask and wear gloves. Okay, but what do we have to do to stop it as a society? And they... Well, no, that, that's what I mean, literally. And here's why. It's, it's the continued transmission. If a virus can only replicate inside of a living cell, if you do what South Korea and Japan do, everybody wears masks, they wear gloves, they don't shake hands, they don't touch their faces and eyes and excess of things unless they've washed their hands, then what happens is you, you work against the virus. You very quickly start knocking it down. And as the people who are infected can't transmit to somebody else, those viral strains eventually die off. Mm. It, it literally is as simple as that. Make but right now, I mean, there are, you know, there are a lot of machining businesses. They're still going, you know, and they sort of have to go. Maybe they don't. I don't know. But right, so those they're, not, they're not going to, they're not going to stop. No, no. And they can't stop. And think about your grocery store. Think about all your necessary services, your gas station stuff. They so can't as long stop. as that stuff, as long as that stuff keeps going, is that going to just make it stay? 
it is unless people get a very conscientious effort actively to wear PPE, masks and gloves, eyeglasses. You already wear them, right? You know? So, I mean, you're ahead of the curve right there. Um, so eyeglasses, uh, masks and gloves will have a decided effect on lowering the viral load. And eventually it will peter out because it's just a numbers game as it moves out. But you think, based on your models, summer, it's going to peter out to some extent, and then September, it's going to rise again with the cold season. Right. So when I look at South Korea, I look at Japan, I look at, at China, they have this baseline 100 to 120 new cases per day with all of their controls in place. They're still experiencing 100 and 120 new cases identified daily. So that's the baseline level. That's the level that every coronavirus sits at, where no matter what throughout the year, somebody's got a cold somewhere. Maybe it's your your neighbor's kid or something like that, right? And it just kind of it just kind of limps around from person to person here and there. And then all of a sudden cold season comes back in and boom, it goes through the roof again. So that'll be wave two. That's what we'll see. Unless we can get like a good a treatment. Decided effort of everybody to really buckle down. Well, no, but in the treatment, is the treatment the key? Treatment's 18 to 20 months out minimum. We can't risk it any faster than that. If you put a vaccine out there that hasn't been tested to that degree, you could literally wipe out a major portion of the population inadvertently with something that has a side effect we don't understand. Mm -hmm. What about uh, the malaria drugs? Um, so, so far they don't actually seem to show any positive effect other than their immunosuppressing effect, right? Um, but I know physicians who've personally taken it when they've become infected and hasn't seemed to actually reduce it. So most of the papers that were put out have been retracted on that. They thought it might have an effect, um, but the bigger effect seems to be from um, actual NSAIDs, you know, we're talking about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Like, like, um, like what, Advil? Well, so a thing happens in the body where it's not the virus itself that's taking you out, it's your own immune system. It's called a cytokine cascade. So when your immune system is producing so many histamine-producing um, after effects of the antibodies, that it overwhelms your entire system, it causes your entire system to become inflamed, right? And your own body takes itself out trying to fight the virus. This is what happens with rabies. Your body takes yourself out when you have rabies, which is why it up till now has been 100% fatal. There's one physician that's actually cured three cases of rabies, and he did it by putting people into a coma and putting them on massive anti-inflammatories until their body recovered and then bringing them back out of it. Interestingly, very similar effect happening with this. And of course, it was next null no discovery. They had some patients that were already on anti-inflammatories and they upped their doses and, oh, wow, things started to get better. So one of the things they're looking at is using immunosuppressing drugs from um, organ transplants, right, where you knock the immune system down. And when they do that, all of a sudden the people come back down, they can breathe again on their own. They don't need to be on the ventilator. The worst thing in the world is when they go on a ventilator. The survival rate is extremely low when they have to when they have to be vented. Uh, but so wait, by making the immune system go down, aren't they then fragile though? Well, that's what's interesting about it. Um, it doesn't knock out the immune system entirely. And so what's happened is the immune system has already produced a ton of antibodies that are going after the virus, right? Um, so you've already got them in your bloodstream. And so it's going to go out there and continue to do what it does. But what you are doing is you're, re you're removing the inflammation in the lungs, and the inflammation in the lungs is what's causing the fluid buildup in the lungs. So it's the pneumonia that takes you out with this virus. Right, the right, exactly. The right. pneumonia takes you out. This is why there's so many people who are asymptomatic. They haven't developed the pneumonia. So, so basically, the inflammation hasn't occurred in their body. So they're running around with a full viral load and just living life, right? Well, is it is it true though that 
you know, at least in the United States, most of the people that die are people that have health conditions or are really old. Um, that's what they thought at first, but no. No, they're seeing young people. They're seeing healthy people. I mean, one of my friends who had it um, for almost a month, um, he is a, what is he, 52 years old? He is a triathlete. He's about one of the healthiest people you've ever seen. Another friend's 10-year-old daughter spent five days in the hospital. But they didn't die. No, no, but that was that was direct hospital intervention. She had to be hospitalized. Without hospitalization, she wouldn't have made it. Mm-hmm. And they already had one of the Navy crew members on the Theodore Roosevelt pass away from it. And this was a, this was a young man in his, I think, 21, 20, 21 years old. And the... The ventilators, you only go on the ventilator if you're just like in terrible shape. Right. So basically, they only vent them if they cannot breathe on their own. Yeah. Yep. So in Italy, it's stabilized right now? I mean... Well, I could actually pull you up the numbers and tell you what's going on in Italy. Um, so let's see, Italy. Talk, talk to an Italian today looking for a Swiss machine, and he, nice. He told me that it was stable, and yeah. So Italy right now is reporting. Um, let's see. Let me pull up that chart set. So you're okay, looking at so, are you looking at data that other people don't have? Um, well, they could have it <laughs> if, if they quite know where to go. Go get it. But so Italy is reporting right now. Their public reporting is 168,941 confirmed cases, um, 22,170 deaths, and 40,164 recovered. And that's the key. It's the death to recovery rate. If you notice, 40,000 recovered, 22,000 deaths. So that is one in three people in Italy. Guess what? Those numbers also match ratio-wise to the United States and Spain. So that means we're running the general same cases. Now, here's the good news about Italy. So Italy peaked back on 321, and they've had some little uppy down waves, but that that peak was 6,600 new cases on 321. Yesterday, they only had 2.7 thousand cases new. So that's a two-thirds reduction in new cases. So in they're not long? out of the woods in- yet. In what period of time? Um, 4.15, so yesterday. So from 3.21 to yesterday. So what's that, three and a half weeks? Um, now, that's that's Italy. If we look at Germany, 135,633 cases. Germany was really getting a handle on it, right? So three days ago, they were down to 2.2 thousand new cases. Day before yesterday, 1.3 thousand. And then guess what? Yesterday, that jumped up to 3.4 thousand new cases. Is that because of the testing? Yep, it's because of the testing. As they test and test and test more, all of a sudden, they find new cases. Now, Germany has a much lower death to recovery rate. So Germany has 3,943 dead to 77,000 recovered, and that's because of superior health care. They are actively, actively attacking this. So what they do in Germany is if you're identified and you're sick, but you don't need to be hospitalized, they sequester you in your home and they bring the treatment to you. And they only bring people into the hospital who need to be hospitalized. Yeah. And they keep everywhere. I mean, they were going out and ticketing people that were going to bars and out to have fun. Oh, it's not going to affect me. And they're like, no, you're locked in. Well, the Germans, Germans know how to follow rules. That's, right. We're, it's in we're their, it's so in their culture. <laughs> it's in their culture. It is. <laughs> Americans really we, and Italians are not yeah, wired. Yeah, we or the Spanish, they're even worse. I mean, we're founded <laughs> by we're founded by people who didn't <laughs> want to follow rules. That's that's, that's right. why they founded our country. Yep. In uh, fact, one of my ancestors was literally kicked out of England and sent to the United States by his father because he wouldn't follow the rules. <laughs> literally ejected out of the family. Yeah, I, um, so what do you think then of like Major League Baseball saying, you know, they're, they're thinking of, I don't know if you're a baseball fan at all, but they're talking about, I used to, but they're talking about like having, having 
like quarantining all the teams and everything will be played in Arizona. And um, uh, is that is that is that a pie in the sky thing or? I th- I think it's a total pie in the sky thing because the players are going to be too close to each other, and the only way it's going to work is if they absolutely test every player and they leave the players sequestered. Right, but so, I mean, like like you know, they'll still be you know, the people that are maintaining the field and the people that are exactly at the hotels where they're staying and everybody has to be sequestered. So I'll take it back to our, they are doing it in Korea. They are starting to play and they are totally sequestered. Those players are sequestered. The people that do all the servicing are sequestered and they are tested daily for temperature. Um, And then they're randomly tested with test kits because it's the only way they can control it. And like I said, in Korea, if I go to South Korea, um, who has managed to keep it down to 10,613 cases. Yeah, 200, um, South Korea, 200 deaths or something. And, well, uh, South Korea's had 229 deaths, and so far, 7,757 of the 10,613 people have recovered. Right? So, once again, superior health care, Right? Um, But the interesting thing is every single day in South Korea, they're identifying between 27 and 35 new cases every day, just flat, just just floating along like a line. And they have good testing over there. They have plenty of tests. They'll test you in the street as you walk into a store, as you walk out of a store. They they test people everywhere. They have have store. Well, I guess we have stores open if they're grocery stores. But. Oh, yeah. It's same thing there, right? They're the ones that started. They're like, here's only essential businesses, and we're going to test everybody going in and out. Um, and so they were almost the first ones to do it after China. And okay. uh, Since yeah, you China. know your stuff, mm-hmm. and I, everybody else, you, you hear one thing someplace, you hear another thing someplace, like, okay, so you go to the grocery store. And what I've, you know, I guess what I heard is that if you are wearing a mask, it doesn't really protect you too much. It protects the other people. Is that true? That's exactly it. If you have the viral load and you're wearing the mask, it will catch most of the viral load in the mask. What about um, what about preventing other people's viral load? Well, that that's what I mean. Is you'll, It'll keep you from spewing the virus out all over what the if place. Somebody else, what if somebody else who doesn't have a mask spews it at you? Does the mask well, help? So it, it helps some but not a ton because the problem with the masks are you tend to breathe in around the gaps around your cheeks and your nose so some of the air is being filtered you're breathing in some isn't but when you breathe out you breathe out directly into the material what about like um sometimes we just use like a handkerchief as a mask is that well anything anything that catches viral load is better than nothing yeah Right. And especially if you double up the bandana, like most people, you know, bandit style, fold it in half over the top. That's pretty tight weave of cotton cloth. It'll catch it. I mean, not all of it, but it'll catch it. So the difference is a person who's just walking around talking is just spewing it everywhere and a long distance. You've seen the models on computers that show how far a breath travels with a cough or a sneeze. Okay, so what if somebody didn't cough or sneeze? Um, but they're, you know, a few feet from you. Can can you get it? Well, so if they didn't cough or sneeze, they can still transmit it just through breathing and talking. And why is so? I mean, it seems like everybody who's working at the store, most of them don't have masks. That's what I noticed, too. And, and some like at our store, um, we're isolated up here in Los Alamos, right? This is the nuclear city. We have one grocery store. It's a huge super smiths. And the problem is they didn't That's have masks or gloves. Yeah, <laughs> but it's it's interesting because um, they uh, they didn't have gloves or masks, and people were starting to bring them in and donate them to the workers. And I'm like, come on, Kroger, you're the second largest grocery chain on earth. <laughs> you can you can provide PPE to your people. right. Well, they should make it standard issue for the people right. to wear it. Well, now they are, but it took them way too long to respond. Well, it seems like everywhere I go to get, do you, are you wary of getting takeout food or no? Oh, very. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, like I went through to get an iced tea at a McDonald's drive-thru, you know, and they're, you know, hand the hand the machine out the window, reach out to get it, keep six feet away from the drive-thru, you know. She had a mask on, a, a good, an N95 mask, gloves, everything. And then I saw another one, and I pulled up, and they were wearing nothing. I'm like, nope, nope. <laughs> I'm driving on by. Sorry, not doing but, that. But I mean, to get, what if you get food from somewhere? Um, are you pretty good if you, like, heat it up in the... Michael well, so what's something. funny is what we've been doing is we'll get like pizza from the Papa Murphy's because it's taken bake and it's wrapped in plastic. So you bring it home, throw it in a 450 degree oven and throw the plastic away and then wash your hands. That's pretty safe. But I would say cooking the food yourself is the best way to go right now. What if you want to get like then, Chinese food or something? Could you just put it in the microwave and that'll well, kill right. it? Well, right. See, that's the thing. It's something like that where it's really hot showing up in a container. That's hot food. But getting a cold sandwich maybe not a good idea no but hot food if if i got takeout you yeah there there's low trans they, they found very low transmission um probability with hot food but it goes up with cold food okay so just keep that in mind right i mean temperature does ultimately kill the virus um and exposure to temperature kills it but it's a hardy little virus so, for instance, it can live in the air for three hours. It can live on copper for three days. So, I mean, these are, you know, they've shown it in the lab already. Things that kill other viruses almost instantaneously do not kill this instantaneously. So, when you wash your hands, scrub them. Yeah. So, the 20 seconds, that's just a magic number? Yeah, it's it's like even even if you hit it with a wipe of Lysol or al alcohol, they say it takes about five minutes of saturation to actually kill the virus. Hmm. So, you know, things to keep in mind. I mean, they've already tested this in multiple labs, so we've got a good idea of how hardy it is. But, you know, this is one of the reasons that coronaviruses have survived. And we just and need so a freaking hardy. test. Like every should be everybody should be able to take a test. That would so make I it so a, much better. Right. I've got a friend um, who owns a genetic lab who is working on on send home tests that you'll be able to um, send home and record the results and whatnot. Because when do you think that'll you know, be? Uh, well, the problem is it's all up to FDA, but they already have the test. It's up to FDA petition to get it approved. So they'll fast track it, uh, but it's still probably going to be a few weeks. A few weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then at least, you know, right. If you got five people in the house and your kid keeps going out and doing stuff, <laughs> I keep seeing groups of teenagers out there, you know, off the trail or some five or six of them like, really guys? You know, they're just like, ah, we're immune to it. No, you're not. <laughs> so, I mean, that that kind of behavior will just keep spreading it around. All those people showing up in the at the governor's, uh, up at the Capitol building in Michigan, we want to go back to work. No one was wearing PPE. And, and that's what keeps everybody away. That's what keeps everything shut down. If all those people showed up in PPE and saying, hey, we're taking precautions, we want to go back to work, they might have actually been able to petition on certain businesses to go back to work. When they show up with guns on their hips with nothing, yeah, not a chance. No one's going to take them seriously, right? What do you <laughs> think? What? So when do you think that it's going to be, when do you think restaurants and bars and stuff will open again? realistically restaurants and stuff for you to eat inside that's not takeout a year yep we are we are in an uber eats world now <laughs> a <laughs> year your, oh yeah oh yeah because think about it, you can't so they're all going to go out of business then that's unless they can deliver everything's becoming a delivery service yeah like every still, restaurant up here in los Alamos is delivery now sure but i mean you know they can't if it's not a delivery type restaurant then they're right. fucked that's right that's exactly not, it's not two months it's a year it's a year yeah yeah because the worst place in the world is when a group of people get into a small room and stay there so airplane cabins <laughs> trains subways um, closed restaurants where everybody's all sitting there for an hour at the table next to each other breathing I mean, think about whenever 
um, people used to smoke in restaurants and whatnot, the person didn't even have to be smoking. They'd walk in the restaurant and three minutes later, you could smell that they were a smoker if they were across the room. That's because those air particles have traveled to you and you've inhaled enough of them to identify a scent. Yeah. So that tells you everything you need to know right there. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm really into, uh, into salsa dancing, uh, uh which is like gotta be like the worst possible thing. Yeah. Yeah. Nightclubs and dancing. Because, well, salsa dancing, it's all about switching partners. You dance yep. with somebody once, then they dance with somebody, and then they would dance with somebody. So uh, I guess I'm kind of glad that I did it at least one more time right before it, because that's something that you're not going to do forever, right? Well, you and your wife, you can yeah, go pick the living room or the backyard or something well, like yeah, that. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, yeah. the idea of going to a salsa place and dancing with strangers, you can that'll be a year. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be a year at least. Yeah. That's, and it's unfortunate. Now I've been thinking about that heavily, how we kind of restructure society to deal with that. And it's interesting. My wife is half Japanese. So you spend time in Japan and whatnot and society is so different there. Yeah. They're not into shaking, shaking hands and they don't shake hands. But what's weird I do is salsa, you go to I these, salsa dance there though. They do. Salsa. Well, they do. And you go to these public houses and everybody is crammed shoulder to shoulder having a beer, right? These things are tiny. Like there's a, a bartender, you got an L-shaped little table, and everybody's literally, you know, come pie, have, you know, and, and off you go. And it's interesting because I was just thinking about how that has started to hit Japan, and those things have just shut down. Anything where people get close to each other, everybody in Japan is like away from each other, Right. And American society and Italian society and UK society, they don't live that way. Um, Spain, whatnot, they are now. So, but, uh, so yeah, dancing with strangers, it's going to be a while. Mm -hmm. So you think, I mean, right now with, with what we know, if we, you never know what we're going to discover. There are a lot of researchers working on this problem. This was a problem that nobody worked on because, frankly, eh, it's just the common cold. You get the sniffles, you take some Zycam and some zinc or whatever, an elderberry, and go about your business, right? Now, all of a sudden, the common cold's deadly. Now people are paying attention. Well, what if we just said, what if we just said, screw it? What if we just said, screw it and quarantine the old people? Well, quarantining the old people wouldn't work. Anybody you quarantine, if we said screw it, it would just be, that's it, it's free rampant, herd immunity. Um, if we did that, 26% of the world population would die. Mm-hmm. Now, would that end it, though? Um, well, effectively, yes, because everyone would then have it. So those who are susceptible would have been susceptible, and those who aren't. Now, the problem is, Take an example of the human papillomavirus, right? I'm sorry I've been keeping you so long. I just... No, no. No, no, it's fascinating. It's good. But I mean, take HPV. So now we vaccinate the kids at like 10 years old for HPV, right? Yeah. Now, here's what's really interesting. Almost everyone has HPV. But we now learn recently that HPV causes cancer in certain people. We're not sure why, but it is the virus causing the cancer and a, and a number of different cancers. But it's not everybody, right? But but it's enough that they're working on treatments. Um, everybody has herpes. Everybody, right? No, and two 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 thirds of people. No, they've they've actually now in testing when they're looking for it. It's really hard to detect. We don't develop antibodies for herpes. You actually have to detest the but virus. You, but what about it's the simplex one and simplex two? Well, here's the funny thing about it. It can hide in different parts of the body, and it just stays in that part of the body. But now there's research pointing to the fact that herpes may cause um, degenerative brain disorders. If it gets through the blood-brain barrier into the brain, it can cause Alzheimer's. Well, it's interesting. A friend of mine has it, and she and she's had it for years, and she happens to be a geneticist. <laughs> so she's really been looking into it. She's like, what is the deal here, right? And uh, and she has labs available to her and resources and whatnot. And so she's been keeping me abreast of of the uh, the research there. And, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, a whole bunch of things that we didn't think were related to this. We've now discovered are related to it. But because no one had done the research before, 
they just kind of assume that everything were separate symptoms unrelated. And now we start to realize they're clusters caused by common things. I mean, when you get down to it, the mitochondria in our cells were an ancient virus, right? We exist because of a virus. The viruses are never going to go away. They constantly mutate. With every single infected host, you get mutations. And so one thing that could occur is some of the more lethal strains could simply die out of this and less, less lethal strains become prominent. And those overtake the viral load and it goes back to the common cold. The research now is pointing the fact that this thing didn't come out of a wet market or whatnot. It's, it's the same coronavirus that's been in everybody for quite some time and simply a mutation occurred sometime last year that became lethal and it started spreading. It was more virulent. So it's not so, a chi- it's not a Chinese virus. No, no, this is a coronavirus. This is this has <laughs> been everywhere in the world basically as long as humans have. Um, I mean, it is a version of the SARS virus. It's SARS V two. It's on the same strain, same family. That was two thousand eight, right? So we, you know, these things are going to keep coming around. It's just that in the giant. Um, genetic lottery of this we struck out this time right but I mean these things do keep coming around I saw I saw a reported case of hantavirus in China pop up a man that died of hantavirus now hantavirus is something we deal with out here in New Mexico and Arizona and whatnot it's carried by deer mice in their urine and normally you wouldn't get it unless you dig around in a wood pile or in your woodshed or something like that and breathe it in or people are picking pinon nuts. And all, so how in the world did a guy get hantavirus in China? <laughs> I mean, that's like, wow. Because, okay. we have, because we have planes. Well, we have planes, and clearly somebody was infected and somehow wasn't dying. I mean, it's a hemorrhagic fever. It's like Ebola. It's almost 100% lethal when you catch hantavirus. So the question is, was it even a person or was it a package of something that got shipped over there and the person opened the package that had been infected. Maybe a deer mouse peed on something that got shipped to somebody and they opened up the box and inhaled it and got infected, right? So, I mean, there's so many ways- Tabor, I don't know how you can live knowing all this stuff. You know too much. Oh, well, you know, hobbies, right? (laughs) You're good at, you're good at compartmentalizing. Yeah, I, I tend to I tend to kind of move functions off, and it's just the way my mind works. Everybody's everybody's got a superpower somewhere, and mine is that I can track a lot of different things simultaneously and visualize how they work. But you know, can't seem to lose weight to save my life. So, I mean, that's... <laughs> you tried tried lots of things, huh? Oh, you wouldn't. Bl- I, I take it down to a scientific level. Oh yeah, I chart everything. I eat and drink and. And I ride, well, you, you see the stats there, right? With every e-bike ride, I try to do a minimum of 1,200 feet of climbing mm-hmm. in every single ride. So you got to make sure. Limit, that... You limit your carbs or? Oh, very much. Yeah, I have found that keto is pretty effective. Keto. Um, but you have to be 100%. There's no cheating, not a single time, not once. Yeah. See, I have a, I don't really do much sugar or carbs during the week. And then the weekend, I just cheat. It's just kind yeah, of like, see, the problem is it takes about five days for you to go into ketosis. But I and, mean, I'm just trying not to like get fat, you know. Oh, yeah. No, no. I mean, that works. Keeping the load down helps. If you're already there, it's a battle. And for me, it's just been a tiny little bit every year. Just just a little bit like an extra pound and a half a year. Next year, an it. extra pound and a half. And just keeps going up. Right. <laughs> so. Oh, you go up a pound and a half a year. Yeah, and I yeah, just see, that's what I was afraid of that that I would, and I, maybe I am. I don't know, but whatever. You know, I weigh one ninety five. It's not. It's, it's, I look normal. That's all I care about. But now one ninety five is good. That that's not bad. I, six, I would happily yeah. be there. <laughs> well, I, um, I hope. Do you do you think you? So you're doing keto. Yeah, at the moment I am. Yeah, so basically black coffee with with straight cream, nothing else, is the way you do the coffee. And um, you just have to basically make all your own food. (laughs) There's just no other way to do it. 
Um, yeah. You have to know exactly what's in your food. You cannot let any carbs. You said slip. you had pizza the other day. Oh yeah. So haven't you seen this thing? They do this keto thing. So it's a, it's a pizza in a tray. It's got no crust. Mm-hmm. It's pretty wild. <laughs> it's called the, che- uh, it's called cheese and sauce. Well, no, it's it's it's. I mean, it's meat. It's like you know, pepperoni, ham, sausage, uh, cheese, some veggies. Oh, I guess you can have meat on it. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, but you got to get rid of the crust. That uh, that'll get you. Isn't it bad for your cholesterol? No, that's a whole different discussion. We could have a whole different podcast on cholesterol. Is a whole different creature. We understand cholesterol very well, and there's a lot of anecdote out there. Cholesterol is the little tiny plug that your body manufactures to plug holes that are burned in your arteries by sugar acids in your blood before they can be converted to triglycerides. Mm. So it's complex little mechanism, but your body makes, makes um, cholesterols and can very quickly ramp it up and down. I was, I got tested and I had slightly high cholesterol. We think as once we, sort of changed our diet to like low sugar during the week i started eating eggs every single day so we were thinking we were think we were thinking because the eggs do you think er, eggs eggs make it go up a lot if you're eating three eggs a day nope nope not at all none eggs are about the perfect food think about egg has everything necessary to grow a creature everything (laughs) <laughs> so what so then what what causes cholesterol red meat sugar sugar causes cholesterol you can literally trace it if you've got a blood glucose tester mm-hmm. um you can you can trace your cholesterol but i've cholesterol. gotten my sugar i've gotten my sugar down then why should it have gone up the so it depends on remember you've got two like i said it could be an entire different podcast you've got hdl and you've got ldl cholesterols right um, and it's the ratio. It's not the total number. It's the ratio that matters. Mm. So, you, and you can go, I mean, talk to your doctor about it, but there's a lot of resources, WebMD. Uh, you can go to Mayo Clinic and they'll tell you how to interpret your numbers and where they should be. I so feel like really some of the people are full of, some of the people are full of BS though. They think. Oh yeah. Because think about, think about how many billions of dollars are spent on supplements and you know, all of that in the industry, that is big money out there, right? I mean, the sugar industry alone is a trillion dollar industry, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to stop producing sugar beets and, and what and corn and whatnot. They make way too much money off that. Yeah. I mean, even doctors, you know, they don't. Well, the problem is your typical doctor gets about 30 minutes of, um, of actual uh, instruction in foods and nutrition in their entire medical career there. So unless they actually go seek out the information, it's not presented to them in med school. I mean, I remember the nurse calling me on the phone to tell me my test was a little high. And she's like, are you getting exercise? Make sure to get some exercise. And, uh, you know, stop eating red meat. And I was like, yeah, just shut up. Like, yeah, it's, it's it's one of those things where um, now red meats have certain problems that that we have noticed with red meats, um, and so clogged arteries, <laughs> right, are plaque buildup, and plaque buildup is something that that you know there's uh, there's kind of so people who go vegan have problems, people who go full meat have problems, um, they're chronic problems, they take a while to develop. You how, much eat red, how much red meat can I eat a week? Well, I mean, the recommendations of these guys um, are to keep that down to no more than once or twice a week. Small portion, you know, like six ounces. Just six ounces? Yeah, yeah. Way smaller than the typical steak we like to throw on the grill, that's for sure. Um, but it also interestingly depends on your blood types and your genetics. Some people don't process them well. Some people process them perfectly. So there is a genetic component. So one of the things you can discover is like CRI genetics. You know, these these 23andMe, so you can get a genetic test and then you can send it to these labs that do real detailed analysis. 
Yeah. And they can tell you what they found based on your genetics and how it matches up to what you can and can't eat. Have you done that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty much a meat eater. <laughs> I'm a, I must come from some northern Germanic type of, you know. Uh, you're, so you're northern. able to eat meat and it's OK for you. Yeah, yeah, um, I do. And it's OK for me. Interestingly, though, my mother, who, of course, your mother always tries as you're growing up to shape you in what she does. Right. And um, she tried to make me a vegetarian when I was a kid. Oh, so bad. <laughs> Horrible for me. But, you know, like my wife, oh, she could survive on salads and thrive. So it's it. There really is a genetic component to what you can and can't eat, and so it it it's a good thing to do. I mean, you'll have knowledge, right? More data. Yeah, but won't they know? Don't aren't they like sort of profiting off my my data? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> but at this point, they are everywhere in the world. Like, think about the country of Iceland. Every single person in the country of Iceland has their genetic code in their own. Uh, national database that's not a big deal for them because they all have the same genetic code literally well not just that <laughs> but that's the reason they do it so they don't marry too close it's a problem when you live on an island and there's like 368,000 of you <laughs> that's, a, that's a really big issue that's and why they so, do it so they don't marry they somebody do. that's too close yep that's Is why it they do true it. that they don't have last names in the phone book yeah well so all their last names are generally Son of somebody. Fathers or da right, daughter of or son of. Right. So, you so. know, Balder's daughter or uh, Hrothnil's son or something like that. I've got a few friends that are Icelanders. They've they've kind of coached me on the whole the whole thing from sagas all the way up till now. And uh, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. So. All right. Well, Tabor, I'm, Tab Tabor I'm sorry to keep you so long, but it was okay. so fascinating. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. And yeah, we can do it again. Well, thank you. And, and I appreciate the patience. And this is this is going to come out probably uh, a week from tomorrow, either a week from tomorrow or the following week. And um, excellent. I really enjoyed uh, the whole thing. We're going to focus on the bike stuff. Uh, maybe sure. we'll throw in a tidbit because it is time sensitive, but um, really appreciate it. And I wish you all the best and um, uh, let's Thanks. be in touch soon.